Good morning and a warm welcome to the 32nd annual Dorothy J. McLean Fellows Conference here at the University of Chicago. This conference remembers Dorothy Jean McLean, who helped create the McLean Center and was deeply committed to its work. This annual Fellows Conference is the McLean Center's signature event. Dorothy McLean believed that education was the best way to improve the world. And throughout her life, she supported many leading educational institutions, including Colorado College, Dartmouth, Yale, and the University of Chicago. I, I wish to acknowledge and thank her son, Barry McLean, who's with us today, and to also remember his late wife, Mary Ann McLean. Together, Barry and Mary Ann served for 25 years as co-chairs of the McLean Center's advisory board. We all owe a great debt to Barry and to the McLean family for their continuing support of the center and of this annual conference. I also want to thank Rachel Kohler, the McLean Center's chair of the board, for her outstanding leadership and support in guiding the center's vision for the future. Over the next two days, the conference will feature more than 35 lectures divided into seven panels on important topics in clinical medical ethics. Eleven of these lectures that will be this afternoon and will focus on ethical issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic. All of the conference speakers are either current or former McLean Center Fellows or, or current or former McLean Center faculty. After each of the seven panels, we will have a panel discussion among the speakers with questions and answers from the audience. Uh, I would like to ask the audience with us on virtual Zoom to please write your questions using the Q&A feature rather than the chat feature of the Zoom screen. Your name as questionnaire will automatically appear, but please include the name of your home institution before you write your question. Clinical medical ethics, which we started here at the University of Chicago in 1972, is a central component of clinical care that must be practiced and applied by licensed clinicians in their routine daily encounters with patients. The goals of clinical ethics are to improve patient care and outcomes by helping physicians, nurses, and other health professionals identify and respond to clinical ethical challenges that arise often in the care of patients. Clinical medical ethics addresses clinical issues such as truth-telling, informed consent, confidentiality, and when necessary, surrogate decision-making and end-of-life care, and also encourages personal, humane, compassionate, and respectful interactions between doctors and patients. Over time, the practice of clinical medical ethics uh, has become the professional and legal standard of care in the United States. The McLean Center uh, for Clinical Medical Ethics has a fellowship program, which is the oldest, largest, and in my own humble opinion, the most successful clinical ethics fellowship training program in the world. Since beginning the fellowship in 1985, the center has trained more than 500 fellows, including 380 physicians. Many graduates of the fellowship program, including more than 80 surgeons, have become academic leaders and mentors who advance scholarship in clinical medical ethics and who are committed to improving the technical, compassionate, and ethical care of patients worldwide. Graduates of the McLean Center have served as directors of more than 45 ethics programs 
believe this or not, in the United States, Canada, South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, South Korea, and China. McLean Center Fellowship graduates have held faculty appointments at more than 70 university medical programs in the U.S. and Canada. More than 25 of the fellowship graduates have held endowed university professorships. Former fellows of the McLean Center have written more than 200 books and thousands of peer-reviewed journal articles. This year, the McLean Center is training fellows using Zoom. Uh, and the number of fellows is the largest number ever, 34 fellows who have clinical backgrounds in medicine, surgery, pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology, psychiatry, nursing, as well as in law and the humanities. The current McLean Fellows are affiliated with the University of Chicago, Northwestern University, Lurie Children's Hospital, Rush Medical College, Loyola University, as well as distant universities such as UCLA, Duke, the University of Alabama at Birmingham, the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and the Uniformed Service University of Health Services in Washington, D.C. I would also like to call your attention to the McLean Center Prize in Clinical Ethics. This year's prize will be awarded tomorrow morning on Saturday at about 9.30 a.m. by Dr. Kenneth Polanski, the Dean of the University of Chicago Biological Sciences Division and the Pritzker School of Medicine. I'm almost embarrassed to say, because I may be stepping down after 37 years as serving as the founding director of the McLean Center, that I was named the winner of this year's prize. As a member of the university faculty, I, of course, declined any monetary award for winning the prize. This honor stands on its own as a kind and generous recognition of my years of commitment to the McLean Center. I hope you will all be able to attend tomorrow's session and join me as I offer my acceptance speech after Dean Polanski's presentation of the award. Most importantly, I want to recognize our outstanding advisory board that includes Rachel Kohler as chair, Kay Buxbaum, Craig Dushaswa, Stan and Ann Dudley Goldblatt, Nancy Foster, Dean Gestel, Connie and Dennis Keller, Duncan McLean, Bob Murley, Carol Siegel, Brian Traubert, and of course, Barry McLean. Finally, I want to acknowledge and thank the McLean Center Associate Directors. They are Peter Angelos, Lainey Ross, Marshall Chin, and Monica Peak, as well as the McLean Center faculty and the McLean Fellows for all their great work and for their participation in this year's McLean Center Conference. With that behind us, I would now like to introduce uh, our first moderator today, Dr. Marshall Chin, uh, who will moderate a panel entitled Healthcare Disparities. Dr. Chin is the Richard Perillo Family Professor of Healthcare Ethics and an Associate Director of the McLean Center. Dr. Chin is Professor of Medicine with extensive experience caring for vulnerable patients with chronic diseases and is a national expert on healthcare disparities. Marshall Chin is an Associate Chief and Director of Research for the Section of General Internal Medicine, as well as the Director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translational Research. Dr. Chin also leads initiatives to improve disparities in healthcare on a national level, both with the Merck Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. During the past three years, Marshall has created a new field of improvisation comedy in medicine. In January 2020, 
Marshall published a great article in JAMA entitled, I quote here, Lessons from Improv Comedy to Reduce Health Disparities, end quote. The article has now received more than 500,000 Twitter responses. Additionally, Dr. Chin was one of the physicians nationwide elected in 2017 to the prestigious National Academy of Medicine. Marshall will moderate today's panel on healthcare disparities. Speakers for this opening session will include Marshall himself, Drs. Monica Peake, Jason Karlowish, Stacey Lindau, and will be followed by a panel discussion and questions from the audience. Again, I, I recommend that you put the questions into the Q&A section of the Zoom link rather than the chat section. Um, please join me at this time in giving a warm welcome to the moderator and first speaker, Dr. Marshall Chin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark, for the generous introduction. And it's great to be part of this McLean Conference and a very special conference for all of us, given that we'll all be celebrating your well-deserved winning of the McLean Prize. And it's about time, uh, given all, all of your many accomplishments over the years as an international leader in bioethics. So I have the honor of moderating the first panel, and we have a terrific set of panelists. Uh, I have some outstanding colleagues, Monica Peak, Jason Karlowish, and Stacey Lindau, on the topic of healthcare disparities. We're each going to give a 15-minute talk, and we'll hold questions till the end so that we'll have a half hour of uninterrupted question and answers and panel discussion. Uh, first slide, Art. So I have a talk that has the unusual title, Japanese Cherry Blossoms, COVID-19 and Hope for All. As the first speaker of this panel and of the conference, I'm hoping to in some ways set a context for the overall panel and conference. Many of the talks of this conference do cover aspects of COVID-19 and equity. And so I'll be giving some general context as a frame. So 2020 has been a difficult year for many or, or all of us. One of the major stresses has been COVID-19. And so back in May of 2020, uh, the New York Times Magazine published a terrific article about how safe net clinics, fairly qualified health centers, were coping with COVID-19 and caring for patients and patients with COVID. And they focused on the, the story of Callan Lord, which is an FQHC, fairly qualified health center in New York City that specializes in care of LGBTQ populations. This is a picture from the article showing one of the healthcare workers at Catlin Lord. And so the reporter, Matatias Schwartz, he interviewed me as part of the article. And the quote they picked was the following. It's the double whammy of a medical hit and then the economic one. If you're a frontline worker, you have to drive that bus or that Uber. You can't socially distance because your housing is too crowded. Then if you get sick, you can't get into your CHC because the centers are letting go of folks. The US healthcare system suffers from a chronically under-resourced safety net. So when something like COVID hits, you have a lot of people who get hurt. And I think for, for all of us, we're concerned about our patients. We're concerned about our communities. We have concerns about our own personal risks and the risks of our colleagues. And we have concerns for the risks of our friends and families. This is a picture that I took. It's in a tunnel. It's a tunnel that connects the Museum of Science and Ministry to Promontory Point. So it's in Hyde Park, and you may remember that, that there's that bridge you walk under. And it highlights in some ways like the, the dual stresses. There's the social distancing and, and the COVID pandemic, and then represented the Black Lives Matter movement. And we've had then over the past year then with all the, uh, the, the terrible e examples of, of African-American men, of other persons of color, uh, suffering and, and um, dying from police brutality and increased 
public awareness of systemic racism and how that infiltrates all aspects of society. The Department of Medicine at University of Chicago, the Diversity Committee, wrote a, a, a blog piece in Kevin MD, which was led by Monica Vela. And, and Monica really uh, did the bulk of the writing. Uh, it was a beautifully written piece that Monica wrote. And towards the beginning of the blog piece, she writes, over the last few months, we have faced a relentless pandemic and seen humans rising to serve the most critically ill. However, we have also borne witness to the relentless evidence of health and healthcare disparities during a time in our country's history in which the discourse around race, nationality, gender, sex, sexual orientation, class, and religion have reached a fever pitch of discord. We have become increasingly frustrated, sad, and exhausted from witnessing the relentless violence marching unfettered across our country for generations. So again, she says, we have become increasingly frustrated, sad, and exhausted. And I think that's, that's the reality that it's been hit after hit this particular year. Um, I joined Twitter about three months ago. And so uh, that's an additional source of information. And you just sort of see it in, in many of the tweets of, of the healthcare providers, this sense of exhaustion and this new wave of COVID hitting, really a sense of, of uh, concern and even despair at times. And so it was uh, uh, during March, and so uh, I live with my family in Hyde Park, and uh, like, like all of you, we're going through this period of, of uh, uh, sort of searching and, and despair and looking for hope. And um, my wife and I, we started a ritual where we would do a daily walk to the Museum of Science and Industry area. And you may remember on, on this particular side, the pond side of the, or the water side of the museum, there's a, a beautiful set of Japanese cherry blossom trees. And this was one of the most amazing years for the blossoms in Chicago. Uh, they, they lasted three weeks, which is the longest that we've seen them last. And it was just incredible, the beauty of these cherry blossoms. And uh, we would walk every day. So we would see the evolution of these blossoms as they started as little buds and became ever more radiant and, and um, lucent and, and really um, just uh, special and uplifting. And in, in Japanese haiku poetry, the cherry blossom is a uh, metaphor for life, beautiful and ephemeral and ultimately uh, withering and dying. And so in some ways, as we were doing these walks, I began to think of a parallel of the cherry blossoms also being a metaphor for our country's response to COVID and some of the immediate policy and funding decisions. You may remember that uh, uh, when there was the hit and there was a financial hit to a lot of health organizations and uh, there was just the overwhelming demand and uh, limited resources. There were a variety of healthcare legislation relief packages that were passed by Congress. And uh, the question then became in some ways, well, oh, actually before that, I'll share this uh, uh, haiku poem. Um, this is Joseph Busan, who is um, uh, one of the great uh, Japanese poets of the Edo period, uh, drinking up the clouds, it spews out cherry blossoms, Yoshino mountain. Wind blows, they scatter and it dies, fallen petals petals falling, unable to resist the moonlight, sakura, sakura, that fall in the dreams of sleeping beauty. So I'll come back to cherry blossoms at the end of the talk. So I was talking about how uh, uh, there had been like these uh, immediate care relief bills in terms of funding the, the healthcare system. And so one of the big questions becomes, well, was it gonna be more of the same, basically funding the, the status quo or true reform? Because with COVID we saw that the people who were, were, were having the, the bulk of the disproportionate uh, burden of, of morbidity tended to be uh, racial ethnic minorities, uh, uh, patients of uh, um, a lower socioeconomic status. Uh, and so this question, should the goal of A be to help the patients most adversely impacted by COVID-19 or to save the current healthcare system? Should the nation prop up the status quo or encourage a healthcare system better designed to address the complex medical and social needs of high-risk populations? Well, at least initially, the answer was more the same. So for example, if access to care was a huge issue, and it is, is a huge issue, well, you know, why didn't we just expand 
uh, for example, the, the ACA, the Medicaid expansion, or the initial set of funding that was done by the government, the CARES Act, Provider Relief Act, largely funded more the same. So I was interviewed by Newsweek, and I told them that the Centers for Medicare, Medicare Services formulas, appear to be designed to ensure that hospitals and large healthcare systems can maintain their bottom lines, rather than guarantee that the facilities on which vulnerable Americans depend can keep their doors open. So I was inspired to write a, a commentary with the title of today's talk that's impressed the Annals of Family Medicine. And I basically stressed three lessons. That first, that there are proven roadmaps and processes for reducing healthcare disparities that already exist. And there are themes of successful interventions and we should implement them. A second lesson was that payment reform needs to create a business case for healthcare organizations to address social in terms of health and implement care interventions to reduce health disparities. And then third, we as a nation need to have hard conversations about whether we truly value the opportunity for everyone to have a healthy life. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to concentrate upon this particular point about the national conversation and the first point about a little bit about the roadmap. So I was uh, recently invited to, to write an editorial for the journal BMJ Quality and Safety entitled Advancing Health Equity and Patient Safety, a Reckoning Challenge and Opportunity. And it, it uh, gave me an opportunity to basically try to come up with a concise sort of framework for advancing health equity, which is here. Um, I'm going to point out that I will not cover the far right of the slide, which is payment reform that supports and incentivizes care transformation that advances health equity and cross-sectoral partnerships to address medical and social drivers of health, individual and structural drivers. Because in January, as part of the McLean COVID seminar series, I'll have a whole hour to do a deep dive into these issues and these policy issues. So I won't talk about that today, and we'll focus upon the rest of this diagram. So in brief, at the top, uh, there needs to be a committing to the mission of maximizing the health of diverse individuals and populations, intentionally advancing health equity. The left side, create a culture of equity. The right side, implement a roadmap to reduce disparities. In between is the critical bridge that what it means if it works is that every worker knows how to operationalize advancing health equity in their daily jobs, ultimately at the bottom, improving individual and population health and improving health and healthcare equity. So I'll go through these individually. So first, this issue of committing to the mission of maximizing health by diverse individuals and populations. Uh, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are coming up with statements saying that uh, we're, we're anti-racist or we're, we're in support of equity. We want to reduce health disparities. And that's great. Those statements are coming out. In practice, there needs to be hard conversations about what that means. One of my current projects involves working with seven teams. A team consists of a state Medicaid agency, a Medicaid managed care health plan, and then frontline organizations like clinics and hospitals. And we found that it's taken like literally months uh, for these groups, even once they've agreed to work on equity, really to uh, basically have the hard conversations about what that means. So for example, does it mean improving the care of uh, disadvantaged population? Does it mean actually reducing um, the difference in outcomes between a more advantaged and more disadvantaged population? Um, does it mean doing the hard look internally in terms of how much it, uh, a given organization like ours is either part of the solution or part of the problem? All hard conversations that have to occur. The related point is that we have to intentionally advance health equity. When I talk to a lot of healthcare leaders, I often hear well-meaning statements like, we're already doing quality improvement. We're a safety net organization is who we are. The shift from fee-for-service payment to value-based payment and alternative payment models will fix things. So there basically is this, this belief that, well, when you do a general type of intervention that it will magically lead to the better result, either through the free market principles or general quality improvement or um, general uh, incentives. The problem is that um, this approach hasn't worked. This is uh, the most recent uh, national data, 2018 ARC quality report. Um, to orient your, yourself, the far left column is black patients, the far right Hispanic, the reference group are, are white patients, and basically red is bad. These are where like um, uh, the column in question, that particular group, is doing worse on quality metrics than the referent white group, and you see there's a lot of red. So a lot of disparities have persisted uh, over decades. So this is 
the idea of like the intentional and the invisible hands. We've talked about how well, you know, this belief that the invisible hand will lead to a better result. Um, but the thing, issue is that a rising tide does not necessarily lift all boats and that we know that tailored, culturally tailored interventions are better and tend to be better for disparities working uh, reduction than generic interventions. And so to improve aggregate outcomes, though, uh, a lot of organizations perceive it's easier to invest in general quality improvement approaches as opposed to, ta as opposed to tailored approaches, or they will intentionally or unintentionally erect barriers to access for marginalized populations. So for example, you've heard of the phenomenon of cherry picking so that you care for just the healthiest patients, whether you're an insurance company or hospital or healthcare system. Famous quote uh, from Peter Drucker, businessman, culture is strategy for breakfast. So you could have wonderful tactics and strategies, but if it's not the culture at your organization to prioritize equity, it's not gonna be done. Creating a culture of equity includes both understanding your own personal biases, so it's often done in cultural humility classes and all, but then very importantly, identifying the systematic structures that bias against and oppress marginalized populations. Last year at the uh, uh, McLean Center, um, I gave a talk, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, machine learning and artificial intelligence and biases. Uh, and it was an example of a structural issue at University of Chicago, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, at the same time, this is a roadmap to reduce disparities, where you identify disparity, do the root cause analysis, and then design and implement interventions that address the root causes. And again, we talked about this bridge, and so the issue is that operationalization of advanced equity goes beyond interpersonal relations to each worker. It's to a good, making sure that they know how to do their, their daily jobs with an equity lens and then reform the structures in which they work. And I gave you that example of like um, the University of Chicago where they had developed a machine learning algorithm to try to decrease the length of stay, which if they had uh, implemented it, it was biased, it would have led to allocation of more resources away from African-American patients to more affluent white patients. And eventually, um, the data analyst group um, actually was horrified by this and have now become national leaders in ways to practically use machine learning to advance health equity. So it means it's a call to action locally and nationally for us. And I, and I know that uh, um, uh, Monica and Stacey in their talks will cover this, and probably Jason also. There's anchor institution principles. So for example, do we uh, hire a diverse population? Do we serve the community? community? Do we have a living wage? Um, regionalization of scarce resources, which I'm almost certain that Monica will talk about, so I won't talk about that. Um, and then advocacy for payment reform that supports and incentivizes care transformations that advance health equity and cross-sectional partnerships that address medical and social drivers of health. So the cities of Osaka and Chicago created a, a wonderful garden of a phoenix that's right near the Museum of Science and Industry. It's a beautiful garden. And they have three or four of these stone Toro lanterns, which have a beauty and stone permanence that the, the withering cherry blossoms don't have. And uh, just like the, the legend of the phoenix in Greek mythology uh, shows that good can arise out of, 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 of um, destruction, I also believe that there is hope and that good can arise out of the COVID pandemic, that we are in a situation where there is potentially great opportunities for systemic reform to address racism, health equity, and uh, advanced health for all. In Japanese and Chinese culture, the phoenix appears in times of virtue. And what it means then for, is that for all of us, it's up for us to, to take charge and to lead and, and do all that everyone can then to create the opportunities for everyone to have a healthy life and to address these issues of bias, racism, and uh, systemic structural inequities. So thank you very much. And I will now introduce our, our next speaker, who is uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Monica Peake, who is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Chicago and the international expert on improving shared decision making between clinicians and African Americans with diabetes and other chronic conditions. Uh, one of the things that makes uh, Monica unusual is that um, she's an incredible academic, incredible bioethicist. Uh, understands um, the African-American community incredibly well, a wonderful communicator, a policymaker, and uh, someone who just uh, wears her heart on her sleeve. And so she'll be talking about COVID-19 and disparities uh, based upon academic work as well as some of the, her leadership work uh, in the city and state on COVID-19 policy. Monica. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me uh, to be a part of this panel um, amongst friends who I admire so much. And um, so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, COVID disparities and how we might uh, address those um, as a community. Um, I'd like to have my slide, here we go. All right, here are my slides. The official title is Health Disparities in COVID-19, an Action Plan for Mitigating Disparities. Um, and so I'm just going to acknowledge uh, some of the areas in which I sit on the university, at the McLean Center, the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Re uh, Research, the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical e um, Excellence, and uh, the University of Chicago Medicine. So we have bits and pieces about the story of COVID disparities. So when uh, some of the first data about disparities hit, uh, Chicago was one of the first cities. And so we know that Chicago is approximately 30% African-American, but represented 72% of COVID deaths. Luckily, within the first several months after that data came out, um, because of the rapid response of the city, that number, that percentage had dropped to 42% of the deaths. Uh, within the state of South Carolina, um, 30% of the population is African-American, but represented 51% of COVID deaths. Currently within California, 39% um, of the patient is Latinx, uh, but uh, Latinx, uh, but 61% of COVID deaths. Um, and within that state, uh, as with that, uh, the rest of the country, we know that race and class are uh, commingled, are uh, inextricably linked. And so for census tracts that have low scores of a uh, healthy place index, um, which is a composite measure of various community factors, um, census tracts that have low measures of that um, have 24% of the population, but 61% of the cases. Uh, the maps below um, give us an indication of how um, little data or how much data is actually missing. So this is the United States. The map on the left shows the infectious disparities um, throughout the states. And the map on the right shows the disparities in death rates. And so uh, you'll see that, for example, Texas um, lights up, uh, is very light and showing sort of uh, very few disparities. Some states are in gray, um, indicating that we don't have uh, really any data. And so um, one of the messages for today is that we don't fully have our hands wrapped around uh, the COVID pandemic within this country, partially because we're not uh, doing uh, the kind of uh, testing that other countries are, so we don't have our hands wrapped around the pandemic in general, but also because we don't have good data about race and ethnicity. So we're not able to pinpoint uh, and track fully uh, the, the scope of the disparities that we have um, and be able to target interventions appropriately, um, resources and interventions uh, within cities um, and across regions. Uh, so that that's uh, an issue. I'm gonna didn't mean to have this slide in there. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk uh, about COVID disparities, why they exist, but also what we can do. So a lot of COVID disparities are driven by structural racism. And so we know that structural racism can cause biological changes, um, meaning changes in the hypo, uh, pituitary axis, changes in um, autonomic dysregulation, changes in inflammatory markers that cause uh, an increased risk for chronic diseases such as uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, all the things that we know um, increase people's risk for uh, susceptibility to COVID infection and a worse mortality, uh, worse morbidity and mortality um, from the from the disease itself. We also know, or are coming to know, that structural racism also um, specifically um, affects the acute inflammatory response. For example, impacts antiviral responses. And there's been data that has recently shown that 50% of the black-white difference in some of the um, social genetic uh, immune response has been attributed to racial discrimination. So not the inherent genes, but when we're talking about epigenetics and changes uh, to our genes that have responded to environmental uh, circumstances. So th these are just uh, 
uh, examples of the kinds of data that's been out there. Um, so this uh, is a study that show that talks about the accelerate, accelerated telomere shortening in response to life stress. So an epigenetic change. Um, the telomeres are little caps at the end of our chromosomes that are protective against uh, diseases and they shorten in response to life stress. Uh, this study shows uh, chronic exposure to everyday discrimination is associated with coronary artery calcification for African American women. Uh, this study looks at self-reported experiences of everyday discrimination and how they're associated with elevated C-reactive protein um, in older African American adults. Um, epigenetic uh, signals and how social disadvantage gets under the skin and how that's a challenge for the public health community. Um, and this is uh, one of the papers that was describing this, uh, uh, it's called the fire this time, the stress of racism, inflammation and COVID-19. And it really does a sort of a deeper dive into some of the inflammatory pathways at the cellular level and how they are specifically related to some of the changes and cytokine storms and things that we're seeing that are specifically relevant to COVID-19 um, and, and how they may play out with some of the racial differences that we're seeing. So um, one of the things that we uh, understand or one of the things that we've been experiencing, I'll say, as a country or as a, as a globe is the, as Marshall had alluded to just now, the combined sense of stress and uncertainty, a feeling of a lack of safety and what's going to happen next those kinds of experiences that we as a as a community as a large community have been feeling that those are the kinds of feelings that people of color and marginalized communities feel on a regular basis on a daily basis so if you can imagine how you've been feeling for 2020 that's how black people feel every day and it's those kinds of chronic stresses that lead to pathophysiological changes within the body um, and the, that chronic stress model is what has led to an increase in chronic diseases as well as um, acute changes or our ability to respond acutely to diseases when they manifest so they're uh, so co so stru structural racism has put us at risk for um physiological diseases, but when we think about structural racism, we're more typically thinking about limitations in individual opportunities. So um, uh, limitations in income, in education, in housing, more likely to be um, arrested and have interactions with the police, more likely to be incarcerated, things like that, that have um, uh, um, impacts on people's life opportunities. Um, and more likely to be subject to racialized residential segregation and within those communities have fewer resources. Let's see, next slide. Oh, this is not working. Mm, okay, so, uh, and this is just a map of the city of Chicago showing how we are, um, extremely uh, uh, racially segregated uh, city. So the green shows areas that are greater than 95% African American, the yellow areas are greater than 95% uh, Latinx, and the purple areas are greater than 95% white. So uh, the southern and western parts of the city are primarily either black or uh, Latinx uh, communities. And although we've made significant progress in reducing some of the racial disparities within our city by COVID, you still see that there are hot spots in our area, um, in our city um, for COVID mortality that are in the Southern and Western uh, communities in our city. So all of the different things that I was talking about for structural racism and how they can manifest in uh, biological differences, um, individual risk can be sort of lumped together into what we would consider place-based risk based on racialized residential segregation that results in crowded housing, poor ventilation, fewer community resources. So when people have to um, think about how, uh, what they need to safely shelter in place, you know, where can I get Lysol wipes and hand, and hand sanitizer? Um, do I have to travel and use public transportation in order to meet those needs? So place-based risk that puts people at risk for infection and um, being able to safety shelter, safely shelter in place. 
um, as well as individual risk. Do I have an increased comorbidity burden? Has my limitations in life opportunity mean that I'm more likely to be an essential worker? Um, am I more likely to be arrested um, and put in jail or in prison where I um, am more likely to be in a crowded uh, situation? Um, do I have access to health care? All of these things um, increase risk for exposure to COVID. Um, and so the, what I'm going to talk about for the, the next period of time is just recommendations that um, uh, are the result of a paper that is currently in press is coming out next month um, electronically and in print in January. Um, and two of the co-authors, David Ansel and Selwyn Rogers, are the co-leaders for the racial equity rapid response team that is um, part of the city's efforts from Mayor Lightfoot to try and uh, address the COVID disparities um, here in our city. So the first recommendation is to require the collection of race ethnicity data within COVID reporting. And I made mention to that earlier on how significant of a problem that is. So 50% of patients have missing race ethnicity data among the states in the union. Um, and so doing so would allow disease tracking across areas like regions of the country, as well as within areas such as counties. We absolutely need that. The second recommendation is to use risk and or individual risk and place-based strategies to decrease COVID exposure. So that means reciprocity for essential workers for at the very least uh, PPE, partnering with community-based organizations within communities for dissemination of resources such as education, hand sanitizer, PPE, particularly within uh, communities that have high risk, uh, high rates of uh, test positivity. I'm thinking about congregate living facilities within this city that has been a place where we've seen a lot of the disparities being uh, driving the numbers where a lot of our seniors are living. Um, our policing practices, uh, decreasing the cycling within jails. And for a lot of cities, we have been um, releasing and advocating and actively releasing the low risk, nonviolent non offenders from prison populations because of the sort of tinderbox that is happening within prisons um, and the inability to, to protect those prisoners. And at the very least, they should have um, PPE and masks. Um, this is a paper that was specifically coming out of the Cook County Jail um, and showed how just the process of arresting people, um, taking them through the jail system and really re-releasing them back, in the, back into the community is a significant contributor for COVID infections uh, within the city of Chicago and the greater Chicago area. Our third recommendation is to utilize individual risk and place-based strategies to increase COVID testing. So uh, uh, we know that about 24% of community health centers do not have drive-through or walk-up testing. When we look at New York City, we find that the census tracts that have higher testing rates are ones that have higher percentages of whites and higher family income, although those are the very census tracts that have lower test positivity rates. Within Chicago, testing sites became more readily available in areas that were predominantly white um, and northern before um, other areas in the city. Um, and so this is a map of distance to the first uh, testing site and the second testing site by census tract. And we see that those in the white neighborhoods had lower rates um, as of April 1. By May 15th, those distances had rapidly closed, but it took at least six weeks um, for us to sort of close that gap within the city of Chicago. And so that means that we're going to have to have an investment of testing resources and infrastructure of in, and of uh, infrastructure into areas that have high case rates and test positivity and of sharing of resources between healthcare centers. And I know that the University of Chicago has done significant investment of resources within our surrounding uh, community based uh, clinics and community based hospitals um, to be able to provide appropriate testing within the south, uh, uh, south, of, south side of Chicago. Fourth is to repurpose ambulatory infrastructure for COVID testing uh, prevention, I'm sorry, for COVID prevention support and mobilization. And so we have as an example Oak Street Health that is based here in Chicago. 
um, and has spread throughout the region. Um, but what we can do when times uh, during times where we have decreased outpatient volume is use it as an opportunity to repurpose some of our staff um, and to do enhanced uh, telehealth for our high risk populations and to do screening for social and medical needs, such as do they need food? Have they run out of their medication? Do they need extra supplies to monitor their blood pressure, diabetes at home to measure and keep an eye on their temperature and oxygen? Um, what are their behavioral health needs and to utilize existing staff for those purposes. Next is to safely isolate and support COVID-19 patients from high-risk living uh, conditions. And so that means, so we have a lot of populations that we're thinking about. Um, the isolation of people who have uh, mild disease but are not hospitalized, people who've been hospitalized like the president but have been released home while they possibly are still um, infectious, and then people who have possibly who've been exposed and may be positive, but we don't know yet. All of those people really need to be um, either quarantined or isolated um, in a place where they can have their own room and their own bathroom. And the inability to do so means that they are then at increased risk of community transmission if they're living in a high risk uh, community in a high risk living condition. We in the city of Chicago have increased housing support for unsheltered or homeless persons. But what we need to be thinking about is expanding those kinds of services for people who are sheltered but still considered high risk. Um, sixth is to implement city and statewide protocols to share resources and patients. Many of you may have heard the WBE story that broke um, this summer about how the pandemic revealed a gaps in care. There's significant hospital variation in risk adjusted mortality from 6% to 81%. And the odds ratio for death is upwards of 3% for hospitals who have less than 50 ICU beds versus those who have greater than 100. And so what we need to have in place are protocols like we do for trauma and for strokes within this pandemic to make sure that we can quickly, efficiently, and safely um, care for people who are sick with COVID um, and need to have an organized system of care. We currently don't have that. And uh, we uh, have proven that as a city, um, this country has not been able to sort of come together and, and develop those kinds of protocols that we need to do. Um, oh, and that was just a, a, a data from, uh, JAMA showing that. Last, we need to be able to allocate scarce resources in a way that can reduce disparities. And that is a whole hour lecture in and of itself. Um, I'll say is that some of our algorithms have shown that they have the ability to um, exacerbate disparities and undermine trust in providers. Um, and I'll just say that with the current uh, focus on vaccinations, um, there has been an uh, increased effort to try and think about how to do that fairly um, and to specifically think about how we can prioritize the disadvantage and focus on structural racism and how that has uh, uh, specifically um, affected minority populations um, and doing so in a way that we can mitigate health disparities. Um, and so when with uh, NAM coming out with their report, what they have done is think about equity as a cross cutting measure um, so that we can use a social vulnerability index in each of the phases and prioritize specifically vulnerable uh, groups um, for the rollout of the vaccine. So with that, I will end and uh, turn it back over to Marshall. Thanks very much, Monica. And so if you could start putting your questions in the Q&A portion of the, the, the screen, and at that point, we'll be able to start sort of collating the different questions for the discussion period, as well as there's a, a voting section where you can sort of thumbs up a given question. And so the qu we'll have a sense then of which questions uh, the audience uh, most wants to have covered during our discussion session. So our, our next speaker is Jason Karlowicz, who is also a colleague and a friend. Jason is a, a geriatrician and a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and he heads University of Pennsylvania's Memory Center. He is one of the international leaders in aging, bioethics, 
and uh, a, a true Renaissance man in terms of his, his skills and, and uh, accomplishments and contributions to the field. So you know, many of you trained, or all of you, like uh, well, many of you have trained uh, on this conference at the University of Chicago. And uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intellectual place, a life of the mind place. But even at the University of Chicago, I think that Jason stood out as being a particular intellectual. And I don't think I've shared this story with you, Jason, but like um, Jason used to ride his bike uh, to uh, back and forth between the university and, and where he lived. And I could just sort of see when he was riding his bike, you could just tell he was in deep thoughts. So I thought he was like the highest risk person for basically like basically running a stop sign deep in thought with his bike and getting like, side swiped. But, you know, fortunately for, for us and fortunately for the world, uh, he survived uh, Hyde Park and is biking here and uh, has truly become an international leader. He does great academic work, uh, communicates with the lay public through venues like the New York Times and Washington Post. He's written a novel about uh, physicians and uh, the, the search for fame. And he has a book that will be coming out in 2021, which I think will be partly what his talk will be based upon about Alzheimer's disease, how it's become such an important issue and, and policy related to that. And so, Jason, looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you, Marshall. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, greetings from Philadelphia. I'm Jason Karlowish at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, I, uh, I'm going to let my slides come up here, please. There we are. Brilliant. Um, so I'm a co-director of the Penn Memory Center, and um, what I'm going to talk to you today is the story of how Alzheimer's disease went from being a rare disease to being a common disease to all of a sudden became a crisis. Why? And in that story, maybe what can we learn? I think that many of you will see parallels to what we've been coping with in the last 10 months. Um, In 1976, Robert Katzman, a neurologist, um, uh, wrote this editorial called The Prevalence and Malignancy of Alzheimer's Disease, a Major Killer. Dr. Katzman's 1,200-word essay uh, put together um, a variety of different streams of research, as well as a bit of epidemiology and demography to make the argument that the thing we call senile dementia isn't, in fact, caused by aging, but actually is caused by um, uh, the accumulation of amyloid plaques. Um, and uh, said that that rare disease called Alzheimer's disease, in fact, um, is all the same thing as this very common uh, uh, disease called senility. And it's, it, uh, senility is not caused by aging, but by the disease Alzheimer's disease. And with that, in 1976, the modern Alzheimer's movement got going. Um, NIA made it a focus of research. Uh, and uh, uh, the Alzheimer's Association was founded. And um, 30 years later, uh, the nation took stock of its progress. Uh, the uh, Alzheimer's Study Group was a bipartisan was formed by a bipartisan request by Congress, modeled after the Iraq Study Group to examine the problem of Alzheimer's in America. And to put it uh, simply and bluntly, um, over the course of this report, the word crisis appeared, appears some 29 times. I won't read in direct paraphrase from this intro of the report, but you can see the opening line is the Alzheimer's crisis. So that's 2009. Katzman wrote in 1976. So what happened over that 30 years of time, or rather perhaps what did we fail to do that transformed a common disease, a major killer, into a crisis? And uh, let's go back to the beginning a bit because I think there's some, uh, the story begins back in the early 20th century when this physician, Alois Alzheimer's, met this woman, Auguste Dieter, who had dementia. And the common story, of course, is that she was in her 50s and what he concluded was, well, she had this thing, this disease that he wasn't quite sure what it was, um, but all those folks with senility, they have aging and they're separate. Um, and, uh, and that's the sort of learned story that was uh, inherited for the rest of the 20th century. Uh, in fact, um, the story is a little more complicated than that. Namely, by um, a, a few years after he uh, uh, diagnosed, treated, cared for, and autopsied his patient, he would diagnose and treat other patients who had similar kinds of presentations as hers and would begin to conclude that um, maybe this thing we call senility and this thing we call Alzheimer's are actually perhaps the same. That is to say, this distinction between senile dementia as sort of the end product of extreme aging um, doesn't really hold up. And the argument that he offered was based on the work of Oscar Fisher, um, 
uh, namely that uh, uh, these Fisher plaques, as the amyloid plaques at the time were called, described by Oscar Fisher, um, uh, were present in the senile as well as in the cases of Alzheimer's. And so here we are in 1911, sounding extraordinarily modern. And in fact, when I read the subsequent case reports of Lois Alzheimer's, um, I sort of put them down and said, my gosh, this guy was sounding alarmingly modern. And yet the story I was always told when I was a fellow was this distinction between Alzheimer's disease as the sort of pre-senile, early onset rare disease, and senility as this very common uh, problem caused by aging and other sorts of uh, uh, collection of things was was what the norm was. Well, what happened? What, why, why did uh, uh, the work of Fisher and Alzheimer's get forgotten? Well, um, uh, this is uh, Wilfred Owen, poet, dressed as a soldier because he was a soldier. He fought in World War II, and one of his poems called Mental Cases, uh, these, are, these are men whose minds the dead have ravished, memory fingers in their hair of murders, multitudinous murders they once witnessed. Owen witnessed the spectacular, um, breathtaking carnage of World War I firsthand. Uh, and he himself would actually be wounded in an explosion and suffer one of the common casualties uh, or, or, or injuries that many of the otherwise healthy young men like him suffered, namely what we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and so I'm going to make the argument here that that war and that uh, experience of post-traumatic stress, dis stress disorder um, are at the heart of why things fall apart. Um, so just one more te uh, bit to weave here. Uh, this is Alois Alzheimer's champion, um, uh, 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 Emil Kreplin on the top there, the gentleman with the large mustaches. And um, I won't um, uh, 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 read in great detail this quote, but uh, Kreplin was a foundational leader in psychiatry and a champion of Alzheimer's work. And in his day, his textbook of psychiatry was the dominant textbook. Uh, Kreplin was to psychiatry as Osler was to medicine, for example. Well, af af after World War I, Kreplin would, like many Germans, uh, become poisoned by um, sentiments of anti-Semitism, which is what this uh, quote uh, reads about, how he blames Germany's collapse uh, after the First World War to anti-Semitism. So let me tie some threads together. World War I happens, and World War I devastates Germans, Germany's economy. It essentially shuts down research, the work of people like Alois Alzheimer's, etc. Oscar Fischer, Jewish, would ultimately be imprisoned um, and just uh, 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 taken out of his job because he was a Jew and later imprisoned by the Nazis. Kreplin would endorse anti-Semitism. His reputation would be shattered. My point being is that the progress that was occurring in this German science uh, would abruptly end because of the First World War. Uh, our story takes us across the seas to uh, America where um, Dr. Will, uh, would champion by, uh, not biological psychiatry, but Freudian psychiatry. Back to Wilfred Owen with his PTSD, it transformed Freudian theories of disease from sort of a fringe aspect of psychiatry. Freud even worried that World War I would essentially end the psychoanalytic school, but World War I would make psychoanalytic approaches to, to illness eminent because how else can we explain these otherwise healthy young men who have devastating um, uh, neurologic and psychiatric symptoms. And in America, this theory of illness uh, would dominate psychiatry. Will Menninger here would be one of those champions of the psychoanalytic school. So my point is, is that Alzheimer's disease didn't become a prevalent disease simply because there are lots of old people and because um, uh, science advanced. Alzheimer's disease uh, became uh, 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 was forgotten because of World War I, the economic crises that have happened in Germany, and the rise of Freudism. For those reasons, Alzheimer's disease was separated from senility and sort of forgotten until finally Katzmann wrote his paper, <laughs> which takes us back to Katzmann's paper. So what happened in the years to follow? He calls and raises awareness, and yet something doesn't quite happen, because as I showed you 30 years later, the Alzheimer's study group would say this is a crisis. Well, what happened? Well, it's a tangled set of events since 76. First, the National Advocacy Group, the Alzheimer's Association, would pretty rapidly stumble over the question of what's our focus? Is our focus um, the, uh, uh, a self-help group to help people with Alzheimer's disease and that particular cause of dementia? Or is our focus a self-help group to help people with dementia, whatever the cause may be? Um, 
And the association would struggle over that focus. Um, and indeed, its earliest name was the um, ADRD, the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders Association, a cumbersome, clunky name that tried to reflect an effort to encompass all of the many causes of dementia. The association would later drop that uh, uh, name and call itself the Alzheimer's Association to try and focus on that disease. But in focus on that disease and the desire to pursue research, the association would stumble um, over a, a frustrating um, a pop interpretation of uh, congressional approaches to funding, namely that Congress doesn't do disease of the month funding. What Congress does is give NIH a big pile of cash and then NIH decides how to spend the money. Congress doesn't tell NIH, give this much money to Alzheimer's, that much to cancer, et cetera. Well, that is correct, but not correct. Um, it does actually uh, allow um, uh, NIH to ask for and get just how much money it needs for cancer and AIDS, but all the rest of the diseases, um, uh, 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 con con Congress had no control over telling NIH how to spend the money. Well, what NIH, um, uh, and so, so for about 30 years, uh, the monies that would go for uh, research funding for Alzheimer's disease were part of the general appropriations to NIH, not specific as is the case with cancer and AIDS. And so research funding would always lag. And finally, um, uh, there would be an enormous debate that would begin soon into the uh, uh, organization of the Alzheimer's Association and NIA over just how many people have this disease, the debate over prevalence. And this inability to arrive at one number that all agreed on would frustrate efforts to uh, organize Congress around what's the problem and what we need to do about it. But there's one more uh, tangled root in the crisis, and it's this man, Ronald Reagan. Reagan would come into office at the same time that Alzheimer's would be recognized as not a rare disease, but a prevalent disease. And Reagan, uh, while no, any, none of his speeches or press conferences in any way explicitly said things like, we shouldn't be caring for persons with Alzheimer's, et cetera, he would pursue a series of policies that would do just that. It would hinder the ability to advance care for persons with Alzheimer's disease. Reagan's look back on the years prior to his uh, election, uh, summed up in the State of the Union Address remark, years of rising problems and falling confidence marked his in the 70s. There was a fe feeling government had grown beyond the consent of the governed. Families felt helpless in the face of mounting inflation, the, the indignity of taxes that reduced reward for hard work, thrift and risk taking. All this was overlaid by a growing web of rules and regulations. And he would strive through his presidency not to expand coverage of Medicare to help take care of matters like long-term care services and supports, but rather to try and um, shrink the size of Medicare and Medicaid, arguing that it was rife with waste. Um, if ever there's this uh, quote from him that I think uh, captured the sentiments of um, uh, his approach to governing and also uh, uh, in these current times even more chilling is this quote from a press conference, the nine most frightening words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, another trend that would have caused Alzheimer's to become a crisis was what I call a crisis in the family, namely sharp disagreements over the role of women. Are women, by nature of being women and housewives, simply the natural caregivers whom we won't even acknowledge as caregivers, or is the role of woman like the role of man to pursue your life as you choose to pursue it? And the desire to take care of someone who has Alzheimer's disease should be recognized as a distinct role, the role of the caregiver. Um, this photo juxtaposes um, a uh, empowered woman of um, uh, who has Alzheimer's uh, in an Alzheimer's Association public service announcement, who's invoking ideas of uh, uh, autonomy, independence, I choose my life the way I want to, versus Phyllis Schlafly, depicted there, who opposed the Equal Rights Amendment and advanced a, um, a cause for family values. That cause for family values would um, argue uh, that. Um, uh, 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 things like welfare expansion of Medicare to include long-term care services and supports were all part of a socialist takeover. Um, and so Alzheimer's disease, in summary, got caught up, if you will, uh, as sort of a collateral damage in the culture wars that would haunt America and even to today around um, what is the role of um, women in America and the role of government to um, support caregivers and acknowledge them as legitimate uh, uh, people doing work. So, um, as Marshall mentioned, um, I, gave, uh, I, I have a book coming out, and what I've given you is a very 
rapid overview of one of the key themes of the book, which is how Alzheimer's disease became a crisis. Here's the cover of the book, The Problem of Alzheimer's, and the subtitle, How Science, Culture, and Politics Turned a Rare Disease into a Crisis and What We Can Do About It. It's out this February from uh, Macmillan St. Martin's Press. I guess my summary take on point to you is I was taught, and many of us were taught, that the reason why Alzheimer's became a crisis is because there's lots of old people and aging is a chief risk factor to develop Alzheimer's. That's absolutely true. But if there's a take home message from my remarks is a tangled web of events, culture and politics also contributed to why this disease became a crisis. I've overviewed them from the beginning of the 20th century to now, and they involve, as I say, world wars, dark nationalism, anti-Semitism, the politics of welfare, and debates about the role of women in the family, and um, the degree to which America should acknowledge caregiving as, um, as much an essential part of the healthcare workforce as we do physicians, nurses, and others. I really value the opportunity to have spoken to you today. Mark, it was great to see you um, coming from uh, your um, arched uh, hallway there in Hyde Park, and uh, I look forward to the panel later on. Thank you so much. Thanks very much for a great talk, Jason. And a reminder for people to keep on putting those questions into the Q&A section and to uh, upvote uh, the questions that you are particularly interested in, and we'll have a great discussion after the, the last speaker, who is Stacy Lindau, who is uh, another colleague and friend, who is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology and medicine and geriatrics, and uh, one of the, the rare people who is an international expert in two different areas. One is, is women and sexuality, uh, particularly uh, sexuality of, of older women, as well as uh, women who have had uh, oncologic cancer conditions, as well as one of the international leaders on social determinants of health, in particular, developing systems to, to screen patients for social determinants and link them to community resources that can address those social determinants and collect creating that, that free flow of information back and forth between the healthcare system and these community sectors. Stacy also is a, a tremendously dedicated uh, social justice advocate, uh, someone who cares deeply about the community, uh, does wonderful things in terms of uh, with her her research and with uh, her various uh, organizations, hiring many community members and uh, truly making a difference. Uh, what, what's the highest praise I can give for Stacy? And so uh, our panel, while we're waiting, we're in the so-called green room. Uh, we're, in, we're in the same uh, virtual space uh, waiting to speak. And there's a wonderful uh, producer, uh, Eric, who, shout out to Eric, who has been um, wonderful with the tech as well as a, a very calming presence. And Eric uh, bears a um, semi-resemblance to the general manager of the Cubs, Theo Epstein. So I said, well, yeah, you, know, you, you have a little bit of a Theo Epstein vibe to you. And instead of punching me, uh, Eric kindly said, well, well, well thank you. You. So Stacy then asked, well, which Major League Baseball player do I remind you of? So I thought about it for about a minute, and I said, is a, a brew who, as you know, if you've read the paper today, uh, is the White Sox first base slugger who just won the AL MVP award. Uh, and interestingly, uh, Stacy's response was, um, hmm, does he play left field? Because, you know, left field is my position. So Stacy knows a lot about a lot. So uh, Stacy Lindau. <laughs> Thank you, Marshall. I'm glad that's the comment that you shared and not one of the others I made in the green room. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. I so wish we were in person. I love being at that podium at the annual conference and looking out and seeing so many friends in person. Um, Mark, congratulations. Thank you for bringing us all together again and congratulations on your, on your honor. And I echo what Monica said, to be among friends, kicking off this workshop, this conference this year is a huge, um, it's a boost to the mood, let's just say that. So I'm gonna speak about in academics and focus on women and COVID-19. I have to get my finger on the pulse of my, my slide button here. Um, you've had a chance to see my funding and disclosures. I have no relevant conflicts of interest. So what is an inequidemic? 
Well, I Googled it on November 3rd while trying to distract myself from the election. And Google asked me, did I mean epidemic? And obviously, no, I didn't mean that. I, if I, I know what an epidemic is. Um, but I was excited to see that this is a new word. And forever, the Conference on Clinical Medical Ethics will be credited for introducing this word uh, to the world via Google. I don't know um, Dr. Dara Grennan, uh, but she's a Chicagoan, an infectious disease expert who almost a year to the date of the declaration of the pandemic published this patient page in JAMA explaining to the world what is a pandemic. So a pandemic is a health condition that has spread globally. We all know, of course, an epidemic is a smaller outbreak that spread to a, a large uh, geographic area. Um, these words may not have been in our daily vocabulary until several months ago, but, but they are now and probably for the rest of our lives. There's another term that um, I find intriguing introduced by Professor Merrill Singer, an anthropologist at University of Connecticut who studied HIV and other infectious diseases, and this is the term syndemic. Syndemic is a synergy of epidemics or endemics or and or pandemics or all of all of the above working together um, to uh, determine outcomes. And here he was studying HIV AIDS in the Puerto Rican population in Hartford, Connecticut. He identifies substance abuse, violence and AIDS as um, a, a syndemic of conditions that takes a devastating toll on the lives of the urban poor. And this acronym SAVA becomes recognized as one of the, a, a sort of a classic example of what is a syndemic. Uh, the Lancet has recently written a whole issue on syndemics 2017. So if you're interested in this topic, I, I refer you there. Even the concept of syndemic wasn't quite working for me on the day when Mark sent the invitation about the McLean Center Conference this year. And that was a day when I was thinking with my team about what we were going to do to understand the status and health of women in the early phase of the pandemic. Um, it, it, the, the pandemic is changing so rapidly and we would have hoped that things had leveled out by now, which they haven't. Uh, and, and so when Mark said, would you speak? And by the way, what's your title? We all have this, this challenge, don't we? When Mark calls six or seven months in advance, um, the term inequidemic came to mind for me. Um, so the concept of inequity um, being forward in the concept of, of this pandemic. This beautiful asymmetrical nebula 7,000 light years away in our own Milky Way um, is provided by the Hubble telescope people and they call it an example of beautiful asymmetry. Um, certainly uh, in an epidemic doesn't feel beautiful for the people who are on the wrong side of justice. Uh, but what the image illustrates to me impressionistically is the dynamic nature, the, the um, ethereal nature um, of, of some of the, the uh, con combined factors that are determining our health um, and our resilience real time in the context of this pandemic. Um, so for today, women are at the center, or at least for this 15 minutes, women are at the center of the conversation about uh, this pandemic. University College of London has a Center for Gender and Global Health, which has as its mission to ensure um, gender disaggregation in the science that emerges about the pandemic and other conditions. So much, so many of the reports, including from the CDC, give us aggregate data. Uh, Dr. Peak showed us aggregate data by race and ethnicity. Um, it's very hard to find gender disaggregated data, even though there are reports in the news media about differential impact on women. So here we see that men and women worldwide are about as likely as each other to have a confirmed case, maybe a little bit more for women because we're more likely to use healthcare, perhaps more likely to be tested, or and we are more likely to be working essential jobs where testing is, is available, equally likely to be hospitalized, men more likely to have serious morbidity and to die from this disease. That those would be considered the primary effects of this disease. Women are more susceptible to the secondary health effects. So the consequences of being exposed to or being in the environment with um, or even having the infection. infection. And uh, the, the lay media tells us uh, that uh, women are more prone to domestic abuse worldwide. Uh, the, 
the child care crisis will set women back a, a decade um, or a generation, and the pandemic has an outsized effect on women's mental health. There have been some commentaries in, in the important literature about um, anticipating sex and gender disparities in the COVID-19 pandemic and lamenting the lack of gender disaggregated data. Uh, Nature in July tells us um, women are more affected than men by the social and economic effects of infectious disease outbreaks. And that's not just this pandemic. That's true when you look at virtually every major infectious disease outbreak over history. Why? Well, we're more likely to be the frontline healthcare workers. We bear the brunt of responsibilities as our schools close and family members fall ill. Uh, we're at greater risk for violence. We're disproportionately um, disadvantaged by reduced access to sexual and reproductive health care. The, the, the main thing that differentiates um, women from men, uh, the gender distinction is women's diminished agency over our bodies, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in the healthcare encounter, it's everywhere we go. And so if there's an answer to the gender disparities, it's to ensure that all women have uh, agency over our bodies, at least equal to men. So um, there, there is a general hypothesis that socioeconomic uh, uh, disparities uh, for women are what are the drivers of these secondary health effects. And so if we can intervene on these factors, we may be able to mitigate the impact on secondary health effects. Uh, my lab has been studying health-related social risk factors. This is a subset of social risk factors uh, thought to be highly mutable, like food, housing, transportation, utilities that are associated with an elevated risk of illness. Um, healthcare cost and utilization. So we hypothesize that changes in these risk factors in the early pandemic phase are both policy relevant, therefore potentially intervenable, and, um, and modifiable drivers of secondary health effects. So uh, I mentioned we were working on a National Women's Health Survey when Mark called, and I'm going to share some of those data with you. Uh, let me first acknowledge collaborators across the OBGYN, Psychiatry, and Biostatistics Department at the University of Chicago. The survey was fielded quickly. We had already been working with a, um, an internet-based survey uh, firm, which has a sample, a prospective panel of the US population. We were able to quickly survey 3,200 women ages 18 to 90 with a high participation rate. We assessed health-related social risks pre and early pandemic, uh, mental health outcomes. We also assessed sexual activity and um, pregnancy intention. So by the way, this paper is in review. Um, it, it, so these data have not yet been subject to peer review, but I'm excited to share them with you today. Here you see our sample, the weighted sample. Uh, weighting is used to approximate the US population uh, compared to the best available pre-pandemic population estimates. And as you would expect, if the weighting worked okay, our sample would reflect the sociodemographic and um, characteristics of the US population. One difference that's notable is the, the proportion of people living alone. In our sample, it was about half of pre-pandemic population estimates, which may indicate or reflect that people were already started moving home uh, at this point when we surveyed them. And you see that again here when we look at the pre-pandemic health-related social risks, a 10% prevalence for housing instability versus 17% in, in a 10-site study uh, clinical population, which was the best available population estimate. Compared to women with no health-related social risk pre-pandemic, women with one or more of these risks were younger, they were black, brown, or Hispanic, they were more likely to be less educated, they had more people in their household, they indicated that their health was poorer, and more than half had one or more comorbidities versus fewer than half of women with no baseline health-related social risks. And here we see the early pandemic change in health-related social risks. So um, we asked women about food insecurity, housing instability, interpersonal violence in the period before the pandemic. So they had to recall those things. And then we asked them about what about this period, the first month since the pandemic was declared. So on the left, we see women who had no health-related social risks before the pandemic. And that light gray indicates that most of them still had none uh, early pandemic. Nonetheless, more than 25% developed an incident risk factor, um, food insecurity being the most um, common incident risk factor, and about 9% uh, uh, had new interpersonal violence, which could include intimate partner violence. 
The patterns look very different for women who had one or more health-related social risks pre-pandemic. The black bars show you the, the exacerbation or worsening of conditions among these women. Um, the, uh, the medium gray bar shows you new or incident health-related social risk. So for example, um, we see about 20% of women with um, intimate part, in, interpersonal violence in the early pandemic phase develop this as a new risk. Here now we look at the relationship between these health-related social risks and these secondary health outcomes, anxiety, depression, traumatic stress. The red crosses show you the pre-pandemic population estimates, which for anxiety and depression are about 15 to 18% of the population too high to begin with. But um, when we look at what happens in the first month of the pandemic, we see almost a doubling, the blue crosses overall, of the, the rates of clinical anxiety and depression in the women, uh, US women population. And then you see the, the circle triangle square stratification. Circles are people who had no health-related social risk pre-pandemic. Triangles are people who had one, and squares are people who had two or more. So having two or more health-related social risks pre-pandemic is a significant higher rate of anxiety and depression, upwards of 50%. Uh, and more than one in five women early pandemic screen positive for both clinical anxiety and depression. Traumatic stress levels were on a par with what's been was seen um, in, in studies that looked at traumatic stress after Ebola or in the context of Ebola and SARS viruses. Those are the crosses in the middle and lower as we would expect, but not too much lower than what was seen in the population after the 9-11 attacks. Sexual activity, um, as Marshall mentioned, is another area of my interest and in. it's an area that helps us get a sense of women's domain over their bodies in the context of this pandemic. So here using a Sankey diagram, we see the proportion of women who were sexually active pre-pandemic who in the first month now say that they're sexually inactive. Um, and we see a, only a few women who were inactive pre-pandemic becoming um, newly active. And how about pregnancy intention? This is important because it tells us about future birth rates. Um, we see that 38% uh, of women were actively avoiding pregnancy pre-pandemic, 44% by April, uh, four to six weeks later, actively avoiding pregnancy. Um, we also see uh, a reduction as expected in the percentage of women who say they're actively trying to get pregnant, um, important for planning in obstetrics. We asked women about having sex. Are you having as much sex as you would like? Are you having more sex than you would like or less sex than you would like? And the having more sex than one would like is an indicator of um, women's, uh, uh, somebody's calling me, of women, um, again, their agency over their body or potentially how they might be using sex transactionally uh, to maintain their, uh, their basic needs. So pre-pandemic, there weren't a whole lot of women who said they were having um, more sex than they would like. Like, but the, the rates are far higher in the women with one or more pre-pandemic health-related social risks. So having a 20-fold higher rate of having much more sex than one would like for women who have one or more of these problems, and more than double that for women who say they're having somewhat um, more sex. And on the right side, and we're do, we are doing a more sophisticated, adjusted analyses, and <clears throat> but we're, we're, they're too preliminary to share with you. I will say that all of these odds ratios are significant even when we adjust for every possible factor that could confound the relationship between health-related social risks and having more sex than one would like. Um, but in the, uh, in the unadjusted analysis, uh, you see the hypothesis, um, the hypothesis that women who are more vulnerable are more likely to be having potentially transactional sex bearing out. And the, the highest odds would be among the women who report that they are victims of physical violence. So in conclusion, um, we find not surprisingly, but um, very significant high rates of health-related socioeconomic vulnerability pre-pandemic among women and exacerbation of these post-pandemic. You might not have noticed this because I went quickly, but 16% of women who um, indicated a health-related so socioeconomic risk pre-pandemic also reported an income, a household income of $100,000 or more. Vulnerability is associated with alarmingly high rates of mental health problems. Vulnerable women are much more likely to have more sex than they would like. Pandemic-related mental health needs are likely much greater than available resources, especially for vulnerable women. 
U.S. birth rates are likely to be the lowest ever recorded in 2021 because we were already there in 2020. But women with more risks are uh, more likely to be giving birth in, in 2021 than women without because of their sexual activity. And all of this needs to be considered in light of the fact that women comprise the largest portion of the essential workforce, the caregiving uh, workforce, and if we, if we would call it that, the parenting workforce. And so with this, I come to a sharper definition of what I might mean by an epidemic, the inequitable distribution of conditions across a population that enables spread of primary disease and its secondary effects and hinders response and recovery to the detriment of a whole population. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stacey, for a terrific talk. So we're now entering the discussion and question and answer part of the panel. And so as a reminder to use the question and answer area of your screen to input questions, as well as to upvote those questions that you have a particular interest in. And so Eric, can we bring the panel onto the screen? And as people are coming on, uh, I'll just ask a, a first general question of 2021, new era, new administration coming in. What would be your number one priority ask at the, the federal government level for the new administration to be able to help your populations of interest? I can start. Sure, I'll start. Um, I would ask that the states take an active role in um, equity. So California has already stepped forward and um, in October um, introduced an, um, two health equity measurements as part of their rollout for reopening. And so that uh, in order for um, various communities to be able to reopen, their communities that are most disadvantaged have to be within a certain percentage range as far as case posit case rates and test positivity rates um, as the most advantaged uh, census tracts so that there has to be some sort of parity in order for that entire community to reopen. Because if we have essential workers from a low income community serving the businesses of a high income community that's just exacerbating disparities within that low income community. So we have to think about the risks um, overall and share those burdens. And so um, states are the ones who do a lot of the innovation. Um, and so asking states to explicitly think about equity um, uh, in COVID implementation um, and reopening. I think the uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that this election's outcome at the national level could transform uh, and finally address some 30, 40 years of neglect that I narrated in my talk. In particular, um, I, just, I put a piece out just before the election at the Hill called Pandemic Election Should Move America to Finally Address uh, Its Caregiver. Um, I was impressed uh, in comparing the um, platforms of the two candidates that um, whereas the, uh, President Trump's platform really did not at all discuss caregiving, uh, President-elect Biden's, now President-elect Biden's platform um, has several um, concrete proposals to address uh, the needs of American caregivers, including an increase in the wage of what we call formal caregivers, people paid uh, to do it, and also to address America's, if you will, informal caregivers, namely spouses and typical adult children, daughters and daughters-in-law, uh, $5,000 uh, uh, tax um, credit uh, uh, to make up the cost of wages that occur. Um, and I was most impressed uh, at an effort to re finally remove Medicaid support as a wait list um, because it's still a demonstration project to make it simply part of the Medicaid entitlement so that people are no longer waiting to receive those uh, long-term care services and supports. Um, those are incremental steps, and I think, you know, in America right now, maybe that's the best we can do, but I'm cautiously optimistic that we might even be able to open up a conversation about long-term care social insurance on a national level. The only country of the rich nations of the world, Germany, Japan, et cetera, to not have a system of long-term care services and support supported by a social insurance program. It's 
rather shocking. The last time we had consensus to try to achieve that was 1988, but one and only one candidate um, didn't support it, and uh, a candidate that was George Robert Bush. So I'm cautiously optimistic that uh, uh, the Biden administration will take on uh, beyond um, uh, the neglect that it's faced over the last uh, several decades. Both, both um, Monica and, and Jason's responses, um, you know, at the state and federal level, make sense to me. Uh, women um, are not the only caregivers, but uh, two thirds of uh, caregivers for people with Alzheimer's and related dementias are women, and um, the, the intersection of gender and, and race and ethnicity. Uh, means that policies to mitigate racial and ethnic disparities um, will certainly um, elevate the situation for women. You know, if I if I had um, the opportunity to speak with President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris, I would say, what does you know what does is the policy remedy to ensure that women have um, full agency uh, over our bodies? And this is not just a, a concept that relates to the issue of abortion, although is where it gets talked about most often. Um, but but women can't have full domain over our bodies if we're essential workers in an environment where we don't have personal protective equipment. We can't have full domain. Um, over our bodies if we can't care for our own health when we're being expected to care for others who are who are dependent on us. Um, so I, I think I would take that principle uh, to them and very happy to talk about uh, policy remedies. Certainly pay, not pay equality, but pay equity, compensation for the full scope of work women do to ensure the health of their families and the public more broadly uh, would be high on the list, as Jason suggested. Great. Thank you. And so there are a number of questions about the presentations and access to the papers and all. And all of the McLean Center conference presentations will be on McLean Center's YouTube channel. So those will be uploaded shortly after the conference. So people have access to those. So there's a couple questions which are similar. There's uh, one from Lenny Ross about vaccine prioritization. How will we convince high risk groups to take the vaccine given the short time frame of safety data? And then there's a question from Kelly uh, Michelson of uh, uh, Monica, will focusing vaccine distribution on marginalized groups create a backlash because vaccines have limited safety data? So, um, again, anyone on the panel uh, uh, open for discussion? Yeah, I'm, I am. Uh, I uh, share the sentiments of the questioners around the concern about uh, adequate uptake of the vac of vaccines. Uh, you know, the challenge with vaccines is um, just think about the influenza vaccine, you know. Um, they're not 100 percent effective. Um, uh, they, they, but they're effective enough to reduce the severity of illness, certainly to reduce the incidence. But you know, people still get influenza despite being vaccinated. Um, and in more sort of, dare I'll say, sane and rational times, uh, we could have a conversation about vaccines. Um, I'm cons that acknowledges those points. I'm concerned that um, the events of the last several months in particular have so undermined the trust in uh, the system uh, that these expected shortcomings that we for the vaccine um, are going to be uh, a, a, a cause to undermine trust, et cetera. And so what's the solution? I mean, the solution is it's about messaging. It's about um, uh, getting out coherent messages for people to uh, set expectations appropriately um, around the vaccines. And it's about targeting those messages to communities um, that are particularly vulnerable, both to COVID, as well as to potentially um, not uh, up, uh, taking up the vaccines. Uh, in summary, the story of vaccines in America is, uh, especially as those in pediatrics especially know, is a, a fraught history in the last several decades, especially of suspicion and, and doubting of their uh, efficacy and even um, claims of that they're actually harmful. And it's in that context, I think we need to start thinking about how we're gonna roll out a vaccine for COVID. 
I totally agree. Um, and I think that we have to think about vaccinations from the healthcare industry and from public health as part of a larger system issue. Um, marginalized people are looking at the healthcare system as just one system in this country. So this year, when we see another system, um, a police system, a criminal justice system, shooting black people on television wantonly every week and nothing happening, that is telling an entire community of people that someone in this country does not care about the lives of black people. And so then to, uh, at the federal and state level, and so then to say, we're here from the government and we're here to help, we now have something good for you. Um, there, there are direct parallels. And so we cannot expect for reasonable people to always partition out or compartmentalize um, different institutions of government. And so I think that certainly turning this corner with a new administration um, does a lot of good. Um, in a lot of ways, but we can't just do good messaging and have good messengers. We have to also right historical wrongs and contemporary wrongs um, that we're continuing to enact among marginalized populations and say we're going to do things differently. We have to address structural racism that is occurring on a daily basis before we can expect the people who are being affected by structural racism to open with welcome arms the um, things that are being given to them. It's as simple as that. So we'll move on to the next question. And I'm going to ask Stacey, you to take first crack at this one. That's an interesting question Could from I, Christy oh, Kirshner. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I know you want to speak in a, in this important topic, so I want to give you a chance with this uh, next one, which is, um, I think, equally provoking question. Um, so Christy Kirshner asks, how can we disaggregate COVID health equity policies from charges of socialism? <laughs> well, thanks, Christy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, First of all, I'm sorry, I'm having a, a audio visual uh, issue, so I didn't mean to speak over you. Um, on the last question, I'm just going to add to the complexity that um, women, especially reproductive age women, pregnant women, uh, this vaccine, we, we have to think about vaccine distribution in light of reproductive health and people's concerns about safety. And, and so I just wanted to add that. Um, with respect to um, Christie's question, Wow, the word socialism has um, taken on a whole new meaning. Um, and it, it's one I'm sort of leaving out of my vocabulary for now. Although, it, you know, I remember as a kid hearing about, you know, socialized medicine and the risks of, of um, uh, that if we enabled health insurance or access to health care for everyone, um, doctors would become government employees and, and medicine would be ruined. So it's a long conversation. It's not just today. Um, I think that the, the strategy echoing some of the ideas Monica just shared has to be ground up that when we think about gaining control of this pandemic, including treatment and vaccination and planning for, for end of life, we have to engage with people on the ground in the communities we aim to serve. Um, and we have skills and expertise from science and medicine that can be informative to how communities are thinking about how they're going to manage with this illness, uh, but we should be there to support, not to dictate. Um, having a highly effective vaccine is worthless if people don't trust it and won't use it. And we've learned in many instances over and over, and, and Monica's work is a great example of this, that unless we are deeply engaged with and trusted by the communities we aim to serve, our service will be um, uh, rendered highly ineffective. So I'm going to build upon Stacey's comments that uh, discussions about inequities or, or racism 
one of the challenges is that ultimately it's an issue of power. So it's power over resources, it's power over the historical narrative, it's power over the framing of an issue. So for example, the idea that like, Joe Biden is a socialist is, is kind of ludicrous. Um, but you know, it's smart politically to try to sort of taint Joe Biden with a socialist label because in American culture, socialism uh, has uh, you know, a, a bad vibe uh, among many of the population. And so some of it is a matter of messaging. So for example, when they message or they do like the, the focus groups of the public regarding how to communicate about disparities, the word opportunity tends to, to uh, pull well. That something framed as well, you know, policies that create opportunity for all, opportunity for a healthy life, uh, opportunity for a chance for uh, well-being, those pull well. So the same concrete policies framed in uh, with different language can have very different levels of, of polling support among the public. Um, and so again, like for example, right now, um, uh, I have these you know horrors of like um, um, Weimar uh, Republic Germany between the wars, uh, you know, the creation of a scapegoat, um, uh, blame for Germany's loss um, in, in, during World War One, and then the current attempts to uh, claim that um, President Biden is stealing the election. Um, so it's a matter of messaging uh, and pretty crass in terms of uh, the political power play uh, by uh, some of the current um, uh, national leaders. Yeah, if you want to read, I, I, when I was working on the book, um, reading about events in Germany uh, in the during the and in the aftermath of World War One were uh, were very disturbing because you saw how um, uh, uh, culture and um, uh, politics uh, can uh, destroy science. Um, and you know, science is powerful, just to use a word you were using, Marshall, but it's actually very fragile. I mean, it really requires, it's, it's mysterious, it's expensive, it's elitist, it has all the qualities that are seemingly anti-democratic. Um, it relies on uh, resources that uh, people sort of have to trust that it's gonna work. Um, and so if you create an environment that doesn't provide adequate resources, that undermines the trust in science, science falls apart. And the story of what happened in Germany um, uh, with respect to advances in neuroscience and psychiatry is a spectacular story of a country just ruining um, uh, what was uh, the only nation that was making substantial progress with respect to understanding the diseases of aging. Um, and and the, the fact that Freudianism would uh, uh, supplant uh, biological psychiatry, and I'm not saying Freudianism is wrong or right, but I'm saying it was uh, disproportionately supplanted biological psychiatry. And that it would occur in America is it's hysterical and ironic because Freud hated America. Um, <laughs> even to the American brain psychoanalysis. But setting all those issues aside, I um, found that the rhetoric of socialism um, that was used in this election uh, was was a replay of rhetoric that's been used um, since uh, uh, Operation Coffee Cup, which was the AMA's organized effort uh, to take down uh, then uh, early proposals for Medicare in the early 60s. Uh, and the champion for Operation Coffee Cup um, was the then actor, soon to become governor, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, who spoke of Medicare as, um, as, as socialism. There's a related question here I'm going to skip to by Adam Rich. Is the spread of misinformation on social media regarding COVID and its vaccines contributing to healthcare disparities? If so, how do we address it? And I know that all, all three of you are active on, on social media and Twitter. Uh, so, great question. I mean, social media is catharsis, it, it, and but it's largely an echo chamber. A few of us have audiences that that span well beyond our own uh, our own political spectrum. Um, I, I but, and I do think there's good evidence that misinformation deliberately spread through social media is absolutely having an impact on. Uh, divisions, the, the creation of or perception of divisions in our society, um, whether these whether these channels perpetuate um, disparities or inequities in COVID outcomes specifically or in health outcomes, I think is a, an active area of research. Um, it seems very plausible to me. Um, uh, and as much as I wish that the strong voices of equity and justice from physicians and, and ethicists on Twitter and other social media channels could uh, be a buffer against that. 
I, I fear that largely we're we're speaking we're speaking to ourselves. It, it's good for catharsis and sharing bird pictures, but um, hard to see yet how it, it might mitigate against disparities. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I'm one thinking like uh, the COVID nineteen seminar series. Uh, it gets into issues of uh, free speech, lies, censorship, um, public health. Uh, tough issues. So there's a question about uh, if the interest in equity. Can we be overdoing it in terms of overemphasizing racism and going too far? Um, can we be going too far? Can we be doing uh, unintentional um, uh, negative things by uh, the highlighting of systemic racism and inequities? Uh. Well, um, I suppose I'd want clarification on what the person means. I, I think maybe what they're implying is that uh, it, they're risk of backlash. Um, and, you know, is it, would the pendulum swing too far and people become hostile to the idea? Like, did we get Trump because we had Obama? Um, or perhaps they're asking, um, are we overreaching and that somehow um, marginalized communities would be getting more than they deserve? I'm not sure exactly what the question is, but what I will say is that addressing disparities in the COVID epidemic is how we do public health. And, and let me just say that again, best practices for public health would eradicate COVID disparities because what they do is use data and evidence and epidemiological modeling to figure out regardless of race, where the hotspots are, where the high risk populations are and target those for additional resources. That's how we eliminate Ebola, HIV, diabetes, that, that's how we go after any kind of disease. It just so happens that the people who are disproportionately affected by this disease are, you know, low income persons and minorities and people who have who are suffering because of structural disadvantage. If we took away the structural disadvantage, they would be more likely to be equally spread that burden within the population. But they're not because we cannot reckon with our historical and contemporary issues around racial injustice. So they're disproportionately spread within the population. But the underlying principle is that we've got to go where the money is. You know, that's why you rob a bank. That's where the money is. You, you treat who is suffering. That's how you do, epi you know, epidemiologically based interventions. And so you, you don't overdo it by treating, you know, people who are suffering in an epidemic. Um, it just so happens that those people are persons of color. And so I think that gets to another issue that I saw pop up about how we address race and what we're really trying to do. So like, I would think that um, what a lot of people are arguing, what we argued um, in the fair vaccine allocation was that we think about how racism, that we think about <laughs> race doesn't put you at an increased risk of disease, racism does. And so we think about how racism has affected people and target those mechanisms. Is it that you're now ha you know, a, an essential worker because your life opportunities have been limited? Is it that you now live in crowded housing with poor ventilation? Is it that, you know, you're a, you know, uh, whatever. Um, how has structural disadvantage changed your life in a way that you are at increased risk for disease and target those populations. Um, because there are some black and brown people who haven't necessarily um, been as affected. So we're not saying that everyone just because of, you know, melanin um, needs to be prioritized. We're saying that the way this country has historically worked, 
those people have been disproportionately, not everybody to the same degree, but disproportionately affected. And we need to take those structural disadvantages into consideration. So I'll add on to Monica's points that, that uh, I think oftentimes when people talk about anti-racism efforts, at least at an organizational level, it often starts with the cultural humility courses or implicit bias training, which is important. But in some ways, like the even, perhaps even more insidious and powerful um, uh, issue is that the way that the structures and policies and systems are set up that bias. I mentioned I was writing this editorial for a quality and safety journal. The paper that I'm writing, the editorial basically found that like there's under, under detection of patient safety issues in voluntary reporting systems. So the systems that um, rely upon the judgment of, 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 um, of, of clinicians under report of safety problems compared to more objective systems. And so, for example, if you have a whole safety system based then upon sort of a biased structure, well, you know, you can have a systematic problem with um, inequities then and in, in safety problems uh, for for uh, minority populations. So, um, is Monica says it's, it's sort of where the the, the, the prevalence is of, of, of uh, people suffering from COVID. Then also, again, it's a systemically biased and, and, and racist structures that have been built in that unless they're addressed, uh, there's only so much progress that can be made. So we have two minutes left, and so I just would want to close by asking each of our three panelists to uh, whatever you want to share in terms of closing comments. Why don't we start with you first, Jason? Uh, well, first, it's a pleasure to be here. Congratulations also to Dr. Siegler for his uh, award, um, well-deserved and, and uh, 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 marvelous. Um, you know, I, I'm optimistic. I think that um, uh, Personally, I uh, uh, can say, you know, uh, that at our memory center and several other memory centers where we were very proud about our outreach efforts to increase representation of persons of African-American um, uh, identity, um, and we would stop there and just count the numbers and say, see, we did it. Uh, we just added in, in the last several months now, measures of social and economic uh, disparity, microaggression, et cetera, to go beyond just simply tabulating based on race and saying, oh, look at the differences. Wow. Um, and, and that's happening across a variety of memory centers. It's a small example, but, but I have hope. Stace. I'll say that oh, <laughs> I too want to extend my congratulations to Mark for his decades of dedication uh, to the McLean Center, all of his hard work. Um, on being the winner of the prize this year, uh, even though there's no money involved. Um, and to thank you for once again, kicking off this year's conference with our health disparities panel. Um, and to say that I too, uh, despite my Debbie Downer comments, um, have extreme hope for uh, what we can do in the coming uh, six to 12 months, as far as turning the corner for COVID in general, um, and particularly for COVID disparities. I'll be very brief, but um, yes, to um, make a difference on issues of, of justice in health and health care needs to be in the workflow, as Marshall pointed out with his talk. Um, Mark, it, it does not escape us that you've made this topic a priority um, in, in many of the, last, uh, of the last conferences, and we have to keep working on it because clearly our work is not done. Uh, so thank you. And thank you to my colleagues, uh, Marshall, for moderating and Jason and Monica. Mark, you're the man. We love you. Thanks to the panel for a wonderful discussion. And, thank you. Uh, you know, take that walk around the Museum of Science Industry. Uh, come cherry blossom time. And I think you'll feel some hope also. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.